Welcome back to Otaku Daikun. Dai here. Let's go ahead and continue the lore of Lord L. Malloy II Case Files. This is part 3 of a series, and it's a direct continuation of part 2, so be sure to watch the previous stuff first. Once again, huge shout out to Twilight's Call on Beast Slayer for translating this. Last we left off, Rhinus was invited to the Twin Towers of Iselma, where Byron Valueletta Iselma showcased the fruit of his magecraft labor, the gold and silver princesses, his two daughters modified into the ultimate beauty. Rhinus brought along Grey as her bodyguard, and for good reason, because after just one night, the gold princess Deidre was found murdered in her room, with Rhinus being a key suspect. Hearing of this, Waver rushes to her aid, and is joined by his students Flat and Sven. Between the legendary mage Toko Aozaki and several other guests at the towers, Waver needs to identify the murderer before it's too late. Entering the picture at the very end of Volume 2 was Atrum Galiasta, the mage who later summons Medea in the Fifth Holy Grail War. He's got a grudge against the Iselma family, and is working from the shadows to take his revenge. For Volume 3, we're mostly back to having Grey be our narrator. She's remembering the past when she first met Waver. The Blackmore Cemetery had a church, and there, Grey approached Waver as he lamented the futility of his studies up till now. He worried that, despite all of his efforts to learn history and magecraft, his true essence hadn't changed at all. Despite being a lord at the clock tower for nine years to that point, he hadn't truly grown as a human being. It's not as though Grey had any special insight, though. Her whole life had been gloomy, as she was destined to be a vassal for King Arthur to meet everyone else's expectations. Ad was her only friend, and she spent most of her time in a grim solitude. Even so, he continued to describe being in the Fourth Holy Grail War. Back then, because he was so weak and naive, he survived because nobody else really saw him as a threat. In that regard, perhaps his years of experience had actually made him worse off. He couldn't even survive off of dumb luck anymore. Others may have envied his position, but on a personal level, Waver wanted to change. Through his lamentation, though, he was determined to keep pushing forward, and so he asked Grey to help him change. With no guarantee for the future, he requested her aid out of his own pure selfishness, even though it would mean putting her in danger for his sake. Inspired by his perseverance, Grey felt that his guidance would be worth more than the words of any sage. After having him promise to keep hating her face, she took his hand. For what it's worth, Grey looks at Waver now and feels he's grown quite a bit. He writes the details of Rhinus's dilemma in a notebook, using a griffin-themed fountain pen. The pen has been in the Elmaloy family for two generations, and he kept it despite refusing any other part of the family's estate. Grey finds the scent of its ink calming, as she links it to Waver just like his cigar smoke. Flat and Sfin argue about which kind of abilities the culprit must have. Specifically, Flat suspects their target may use Baritsu, the same martial arts employed by Sherlock Holmes, except he exaggerates its ability to survive falling from cliffs, turning invisible, and passing through walls. Plus, since Waver is a detective, apparently he should be able to use it too. Sfin reasonably shoots down all of these spontaneous ideas. Back at the clock tower, their classmates often worry that even simple arguments like this could end up blowing up the classroom. Grey interprets Sven's obsession with her to be a sign of hatred. While talking to Flat, Sven still makes passing glances at her, which she thinks are attempts to keep her in check. Rhinus figures this out just from watching Grey's subtle behaviors, claiming that, in her own way, she's just as talkative as Ad. Sarcastically, Ad describes himself as a quiet, intellectual box. Yeah, right. Easily distracted, Flat asks to talk with Ad, getting rather pushy. Sven gets defensive, and just as Waver orders him to stay at least five meters away from Grey, someone comes to see them. Estella, the Princess of Silver, and her maid Regina approach them in the sunset. Waver assures the two of his determination to solve the case, confiding in Rhinus's innocence. Even so, Volumen Hydrargerum, or Tremau, is still being stored away somewhere on the estate. Rhinus tries to act calmly, but in truth, having her mystic code confiscated is a huge threat, leaving her uneasy. Waver gives Regina her sister's necklace, the Celtic charm that has clear sentimental value. Before she gets too nostalgic about it, though, a sudden chill runs through everyone. The Iselma's bounded field is alerting them of an intrusion. 
Regina and the Princess of Silver quickly leave, as Flat estimates a large group of maybe 20 to 30 people entering through the forest. He may be a spaz, but Flat's ability to detect magical energy is unparalleled. An army of mages is attacking the estate, and Waver declares them to be the same people Finn was asked to investigate. Suddenly, the sky darkens, and a bolt of lightning strikes down upon them. Grey grabs and shields Waver from the blast. Tactically, the lightning is a means of attacking the land, disrupting the flow of mana in the area. It's one way for mages to deprive their enemies of a territorial advantage. In response, magical energy is detected in the Tower of the Moon, which Waver takes to indicate the location of Byron's workshop. Waver suggests that they all run and hide for now, but unfortunately, Flat is already sprung into action. Also ignoring orders, Sven takes off into the forest following Flat's scent. The lightning came from Atram Galiasta's magecraft. With a pair of opera glasses from the hotel lobby, he observes the Iselma stayed from a nearby plateau. He holds on to a scantily clad beauty who praises his every action. In all fairness, conjuring storm clouds and lightning in the modern era is actually pretty impressive, but it's not like he's done it alone. Instead, Atram has come with the help of dozens of magi dedicated to his family. He orders his army to raid the towers and plunder everything they can. His family rose to power in the first place through taking whatever they wanted. As their successor, Atram learned this through various competitions with his brothers. He became the head of the Galiasta family for being the most efficient and ruthless, surpassing even his own father. Byron detects the nature and scale of this attack through a mystic code, a water basin that ripples in proportion to mana used within his territory. He takes the attack as a declaration of war, calling for Mayo and Islo to look after Estella. Lady Enora, head of the Valuoletta family, refuses to intervene in the conflict, making Byron suspect that she might be in collusion with the enemy. He reasons Enori might have even been the one to kill Deidre and Kalina. As such, he's on his own to face this army. We get a bit of backstory for Flat. He's a boy from the Mediterranean, born as a prodigy to the Escardos family. For generations, the family had developed its magic circuits and spells, but never had any mages of great renown. This changed when Flat was born, so they immediately enrolled him at the clock tower. At first, Flat was put into necromancy, but later trained under Rocco Belfabon for a few months. He has a history of being bored with his classes, and resubmitting his paperwork to transfer to other departments. Even worse, he would alter and innovate on his teacher's spells, humiliating them. He, like other problem students, was finally entrusted to Waver's class. With the help of some strengthening magecraft, Flat runs through the forest to match the pace of a professional marathon runner. Staring up at the stormy sky as he runs, Flat notices how weather manipulation magecraft has side effects that prevents it from being used in public. Out of the 32 or so people collaborating on the spell, two of them aren't pulling their slack. They're his enemy right now, but he considers telling them how to improve their casting. Sven catches up and demands they turn back, but Flat reasons that if they can beat up these attackers, maybe the Iselma family will give back Tremau as a gesture of thanks. It's a reckless plan, but Sven buys into it, only to get revenge on how they nearly struck Grey with their lightning. How dare they? Heading to the forest himself, Byron confronts some of the invaders. While he praises their attempt, he declares that Iselma is not defenseless. By sticking his cane into the ground, he releases a swarm of bubbles that reflect his enemy. These rainbow spheres of Iselma surround them before bursting. Those nearby it hit the ground, clawing at their throats. Upon popping, these bubbles destroy oxygen, causing enemies to suffocate. The survivors retaliate with lightning bolts, which slip through the bubbles enough to bring Byron to his knees. With another jab of his cane, though, the bubbles double in number, forming a rainbow fortress. From behind, Flat arrives, confirms Byron's identity, and then orders Finn to attack. More precisely, Flat keeps addressing Finn as Le Chien against his will. The attackers are caught off guard when Sven unleashes a howl that repels their magecraft like a shockwave. With a spell called Polita Mors, or Pale Death, he emanates as a phantasmal wolf. Bestial magecraft, in essence, hopes to grant animalistic abilities to humans. Chinese martial arts like Qin Yi Chuan and white crane boxing, and even Western ballet take inspiration from animal movements. The very moment humans advanced from the animal kingdom, animals became revered as a mystery. 
Sven's magecraft uses the same idea. Like a berserker clad in the skin of a bear, he infuses his body with the mystery of beasts to empower himself far more than your typical strengthening spell. At blinding speed, Sven starts tearing through the enemy mages, forcing the survivors to switch strategies. They scatter to activate a different spell, but they are interrupted when Flat invokes Play Ball, Intervention Start. By waving his hands in a circle around a doll, he turns the mage's lightning back on themselves. It resembles a voodoo curse, something that would never be taught at the European clock tower, but of course Flat is an exception. He has an affinity for Void, granting him access to all sorts of spells. Normally, when a mage gathers spells of various styles into one, it's called Chaos Magecraft. But in Flat's case, Waver calls it Strange Magecraft, which Flat actually prefers. The problem with this method is that it's nearly impossible for a mage to truly master all these different techniques and unite them. Yet, Flat is able to produce results from intuition. Both Flat and Sven are constantly bickering, but even through their feuding, they coordinate their attacks as if they were twins who trained together all their lives. Meanwhile, Grey, Waver, and Rhinus stay out of the rain beneath a tree. Frustrated, Waver smokes while admitting his students are probably fine, even if they are up against Atram Galiasta, the man he had them investigate. The Galiasta family comes from the Middle East and used curses to manipulate their way into the oil industry. Their large financial prowess has them in competition with the clock tower, and in this case, a bidding war took place over a certain talisman, likely for the very same item that Mick is looking for. Whether that means he's behind the murders, though, remains a mystery. Perhaps Atrum had sent someone to steal the talisman, but killed Diodora when she figured out the plan. But if so, why return her to her bed? And what about that mystic lock? Ad pressures Grey into offering some theories of her own, even though she doesn't think she's very smart. In a moment of surprising insight, Ad points out that she only thinks that way because she always assumes she won't be successful. She was a girl who was too afraid of ghosts to consider killing herself, because it would make her one of them. The topic hits real close to home, making her feel especially powerless as Rhinus and Waver continue offering ideas. She sinks into a morbid despair, yet something about what Waver said earlier about cosmetic surgery struck a chord with her. Interrupting the discussion, Grey courageously pulls back her hood and suggests her face might be relevant somehow. Rhinus is not aware that Grey's current face is not her original one, so hearing about it comes as a surprise. She informs Rhinus that Ad is a noble phantasm, and her family sought to create someone capable of wielding it. In other words, King Arthur, or rather a person who is exactly identical to Artoria Pendragon, down to the very organs and blood vessels. It was an impossible task, but they felt that if they could at least match Artoria's physical properties, the rest of her mystical elements would come into place. As such, over the years, many different people were created, and Grey is just the one that happened to succeed. At first, she was seen as a failure like the others, born with a sensitivity to ghosts, but ultimately being her own person. Ten years ago, however, her face began to change when she went to look in the mirror. Rather painfully, her face shaped itself little by little, and she could hear the creaking of her muscles and bones as she became unrecognizable. In response, her family showered her with hugs and delight, and as proof of her transformation, she began to resonate with Ad enough to communicate. Because Grey hated her new face, she made Waver promise to hate it as well. It was her selfish request. Based on the fact that Diadra had no mirrors in her room, Grey suspects that the princess's face was artificial like hers. If so, Diadra may have been just as afraid of her own reflection as Grey was. Kindly, Waver puts his hand to Grey's cheek, wiping away her tears. After a moment of silence, he has an epiphany. He rants to himself as he sorts out the details. Before explaining his thoughts, though, he bluntly asks Grey for a favor. Watching from the Tower of the Moon, Toko Aozaki sips a cup of tea. She eyes one of her familiars, a puppet she had constructed from springs, gears, and string, inspired by the familiars made by the Einsburn family during the Fourth Grail War. If you recall, Irisfield could create bird-like creatures from strands of her hair. This isn't to say that the Einsburns inspired Toko to make puppets in general, but rather just this specific one. She's always interested in expanding her craft, and doesn't like doing things that don't seem interesting to her. 
Either way, Toko's puppet, with wings of brass, is flying above the Tower of the Sun. With a sigh, she diverts her attention to an ominous bag kept in the corner of the room. Following their orders, Mayo and Islo remain in the Tower of the Moon to avoid the fighting. They share an underground workshop adorned with both pharmaceutical and craftsman tools. Islo wonders what the heck to do now. Personally, he's not interested in other people or even his own magecraft. All of it is a means to an end so that he can witness something beautiful. The dresses he weaves for the princesses are practically mystic codes meant to draw out their beauty. His family, the Sebunan, have been cooperating with the Iselmas on this for years, and their current success is the pinnacle of that effort. Mayo, on the other hand, is still devastated by Deidre's death. While he is currently the clinician of both princesses, he grew up alongside them as playmates. Mage children rarely interact with one another, but due to the necessity for him to understand his patients' bodies, they were close. Thus, Mayo has fond memories of playing with the girls, participating in games introduced by the maids Kalina and Regina. Islo comments that he enjoyed playing hopscotch, but rarely participated because he felt Mayo was defensive of Diadra. It's too much for Mayo to handle, making him want to curl up on the floor and dismantle his psyche. Apparently, some magi are able to employ self-hypnosis, such as field stripping, which deconstructs their mental state to erase stress. Mayo, however, would almost prefer having never been born, all so that he wouldn't have had to experience loss. Their silence is broken when Estella and Regina step in. The two mages have a hard time addressing the Princess of Silver, noting how her face is not the one they grew up seeing. It was the product of their own work, but her face was still unfamiliar to them. Much of her original self was scrapped in her creation, so she's more princess than she is the original Estella now. Either way, she's come to ask for help, declaring that she thinks Inora, Lord Valuoletta, killed her sister. The accusation is that, since the Iselmas are but a branch family of the Valuoletta, the main family wouldn't want them growing too powerful. To stifle the success of the princesses, Inori would have easily been able to kill Diadra in her own room and then blame it on a mystic code like Trimau. Confiding in this, Mayo gathers his resolve, wanting to help Estella. Thanks to Sfin and Flat's efforts, Byron is able to make his way through the forest and find Atrum Galiasta on the other side. Atrum asks Byron to surrender the talisman, but neither side will budge. As the two are about to fight, Sfin catches up and requests that if he can defeat the intruders, perhaps Byron will return Trimau. Irritated, Atrum interrupts, reaching into his suit to pull out a small pot called a primeval battery, one of the oldest batteries in the world found in the Middle East. His family preserved the means of creating such ancient batteries, and Atrum uses them to power his lightning spells. By chanting rage, gush out, he turns that electricity into a giant hand that swings forward. Spin cancels the attack out with his roar before calling his opponent's technique second rate. Lightning spells like this are great for combat, but as someone trying to act like a prestigious mage, it makes Atrum seem more like a spellcaster. Now, it might not seem like much, but calling a mage a spellcaster is grade A smack talk. Infuriated, Atrum activates his crest and unleashes lightning in the shape of a dragon. Just before the dragon can bite down, though, Sfin leaps out of the way and comes falling toward Atrum's head. On the other end of the estate, Inori and Mick try to make a swift getaway on a horse-drawn carriage when Estella and Regina confront them. Cutting to the heart of the matter, Estella asks if Inori killed Diadra, also accusing Mick of being involved. Mick denies being an accomplice. Inori, in turn, only admits to being in contact with Atrum Galiasta and agreeing not to defy him. That said, she didn't technically ask him to come attack the towers. Assuming she did kill Diadra, it's not as though she'd be held accountable in a court of law. Plus, Diadra was already trying to defect, giving Inori every reason to exact punishment. Basically, there's no way to properly incriminate Inori for anything. Thus, Estella urges Inori to kill her, with Mayo and Islo as key witnesses. If they spread the word of this, not even a lord can escape persecution. I assume this means that Estella would kill herself and make it seem like a murder to frame Inori. That, or Estella will simply get in Inori's way until a fight breaks out. Before that can happen, though, Waver comes sprinting through the rain, begging them to wait. 
Inorai says she has no reason to stick around now that it's turned into an all-out war, but Waver insists he has a plan to stop the attack. Rhinus volunteers to follow this plan and defeat the intruders. Apparently, this plan also requires Mayo and Islo's cooperation. To buy them some time, Waver asks Gray to assist Flat and Sven. Speaking of those two, after dodging an electric net falling from above, Sven goes into attack again when suddenly, he's struck in the side and blasted away by an attack from Toko. With her glasses off, Toko steps into the fray and stands by Atram. She's been asked to defend the bastard. When Flat tries to take her on, he too is sent flying. Flat may be able to interrupt and reverse someone else's spells, but in Toko's case, she's fast enough to complete the spell before he can interfere. She fights with Rune Magecraft, drawing the symbol for Fehu into the air, with the Alge's rune on each side. In exchange for the time it takes to draw these runes, the actual spell they cause can be activated almost instantly by passing mana through them. This doesn't give Flat any chance to interfere. He can sense that Toko's raw mana output isn't especially strong, but the ease at which it flows through her is beautiful in its own right. Seeing this, Flat decides to retreat, asking Sfin to do the same. More specifically, he's already fled the scene, sneaking through the shadows while leaving illusory copies behind that just stand there, repeating the same phrase over and over. Toko's impressed, baffled even, by Flat's remarkable abilities. Magecraft, in essence, is a process of channeling mana through a foundation to cause a supernatural phenomenon. Like a madman, Flat creates these foundations on the fly, as though he's inventing new spells every time he performs them. Toko disperses the shadow copies by writing the symbol Soilo, melting them away with the heat of the morning sun. Despite the warning, Sfin doesn't intend to flee like Flat did. Toko then tells Atram to go on ahead, but before that can happen, one more of Flat's shadow copies starts talking. It tells her that if she's after money, it would be better for her to just knock Atram out and replace him with an identical puppet. Sadly, such a thing goes against her sense of aesthetics. She wouldn't want to make a puppet of that guy. Thus, Atram angrily awakens his knocked-out allies with electricity before confronting Byron once more. They try to resume their argument, but Sfin refuses to back down. It's rather foolish, considering Toko had previously inscribed runes into the ground all throughout the forest. Sfin goes to escape, but is grabbed by one of the attackers with the Mana's rune written on them. She has the whole forest under her control and detonates her runes to catch Sfin in a large explosion. The phantasmal wolf around him is blown apart, and he loses consciousness. Flat's not out of the woods yet either. As he runs away, he is pursued by a two-dimensional black cat projected on the ground. Even after spamming a variety of offensive spells on it, the cat remains unharmed. As the gap between them shrinks, Flat unleashes a spell strong enough that it sends even him flying. Again, to no avail. Fortunately, he's greeted by a familiar voice. It is Grey who's come to the rescue. She transforms Ad into a scythe and slashes into the cat. Treating this as a minor disturbance, the cat counters with its claws, shaving off a few strands of Grey's hair. She absorbs the mana from her surroundings, which takes the form of a ghostly flame in her chest. Spinning like a top, she swings at the cat, with her blade continually making contact without inflicting damage. Ad then senses the cat's true form, and with a slash toward the sky, Grey tears through an invisible object. It's another puppet familiar, this time in the shape of a bird. It's the one Toko was eyeing earlier, and was projecting the cat through its eyes with something like a film reel. After cutting it down, the cat illusion vanishes. Only a grand-ranked mage can make something like that, and sure enough, Toko approaches them, having seen firsthand how formidable Ad is. This is what Waver was most worried about. She confesses she lets Finn survive because he brought back some good memories. Even so, she's been commissioned to be Waver's enemy. Toko fights back with several runes, but Grey is able to deflect them with her own magical energy. Flat then tries to sneak up on Toko from behind, only to be struck by a high kick. He's sent flying into a tree and is knocked out. For as amazing as Flat is in most respects, his weakness is being inept at close quarters combat. Grey rushes in to attack Toko directly, only to stop right at the last second. Toko has pulled out her bag, and from within its dark recesses, a pair of eyes shine through. Grey instinctively stops in response to what is clearly a nightmarish creature inside. 
A tentacle squirms out and wraps itself around Gray's scythe and her hands. While subdued, she's unable to help as Byron is thrown into the mud. Atram is superior in actual combat, gaining an upper hand. He is followed by subordinates, one of which is dragging Sfin along by the neck. Another one takes Flat's unconscious body hostage as well. Despite all this, Byron still refuses to surrender the talisman, but since he can't move anymore, Atram shifts his attention to Toko, who has Grey immobilized. Feeling useless, Grey recalls the words of her people that she is the closest to a hero. To break free, she submits to discarding herself, chanting Grey, Rave, Crave, Deprave, and Grave Me. Responding to the poem, the contents of Toko's bag break free, and she admits they're all screwed. Just as Grey is about to call upon Rungo Miniad, though, another chant rings out, saying, Ecce Homo, or Behold the Man. Waver's plan is set into motion. Rhinus focuses her mystic eyes, overreacting to the surrounding mana, while Islo and Mayo reconstruct the Princess of Gold in the forest, drawing the attention of everyone present. Ad returns to his cage, and Toko's creature also retreats to its bag. Even the stormy sky is driven away by Diadra's revival. In truth, however, it is actually Estella, the Princess of Silver, and upon her body, Rhinus and the others were able to project Diadra's image. Even as just a projection, Diadra's unparalleled beauty commanded everyone and everything in her vicinity. Normally, Rhinus's hypersensitive eyes are a detriment, but in this case, they allowed her to be far more precise. Toko admits defeat, or rather, claims she won't be able to cast high-level magic for the next couple of hours now that Diadra's image is fresh in her mind. Grey collapses into Waver's arms, and he apologizes for asking her to buy so much time for them. It's now time to reward her for her efforts. Waver hopes to negotiate for the return of Sfin and Flat, explaining that he knows about Atram's grudge. The talisman they're coveting is, in fact, the relic of a certain heroic spirit. As much as Atram wants it for the Fifth Grail War, threatening Byron is pointless, since he doesn't know where it is. Waver claims to know its location, though, and offers the truth in exchange for his students. He even says that if he's wrong, he'll give up an even better relic, the one he used in the Fourth Grail War, the torn piece of Iskandar's cape. Unable to refuse such a stacked proposition, Atram actually complies. Everyone gathers in the Moon Tower's lobby, where Inori waits with a glass of whiskey. She's impressed by how Waver has really taken over this whole ordeal. Truly, everyone is here at a ceasefire due to his crazy plan. In all, you've got Inori, Mick, Atram, Estella, Regina, Mayo, Islo, and Byron, all eager to hear Waver's theory. Thus, reluctantly, Byron has servants bring forth the box containing Trimau, and cuts it open to give Rhinus back her companion. Sfin and Flat enter the lobby, carrying Kalina's corpse wrapped in a blanket. In front of everyone, Waver inspects the body, and confirms that Kalina's tympanic membranes are torn, a sign of hearing loss. Grey then remembers Diadra having the same ailment when they met the first night. Following that logic, Waver declares that Kalina's body right there is the Princess of Gold. He has Flat pull up a diagram, and using mist from Tremau's arm, they display the diagram in the air for everyone to see. It's a horoscope, a map of the heavens showing the planets in their orbits. Waver reiterates that Iselma Magecraft uses the towers of sun and moon to harness the orbital positions of the solar system. Presumably, the princesses of gold and silver were perfected by the use of the talisman. But if that's true, then the timing doesn't align with any significant celestial arrangements. Neither an eclipse at noon, nor the sun and moon being opposite each other, with Saturn at a 120 degree angle, have occurred in the past month. In that case, how are they able to complete the princesses in this incompatible time frame? Waver suspects that if something takes the sun's place, they could force that compatibility. For instance, mages can sometimes use Venus as a substitute for the sun, as it appears to be the brightest star in the sky. Mind you, it's not scientifically accurate, but if it's based on traditional human belief, it's relevant for magecraft. All the different stories about Venus being associated with gods and angels have value as mysteries. Estella interrupts, asking that if Kalina is the Princess of Gold, then what about Diadra's brutalized corpse? Waver clarifies that Diadra is in fact the real Princess of Gold, but not the one shown off at the Assembly the other day. That's because Diadra had died sometime before the Assembly, and was only discovered the morning after. 
Byron finds this preposterous, but Waver claims he's hiding the truth. To confirm these accusations, Waver asks Toko to observe Kalina's body and confirm whether or not she actually performed plastic surgery on the young maid. Toko claims she doesn't remember doing anything of the sort, but he insists she inspect the body anyway. Spotting signs of surgery with the naked eye, she admits that, yes, this is actually her work. Waver says it's not that she forgot about this surgery, but rather she never remembered doing it from the start. He then references the medicine Mayo took to make himself drunk, and suspects that Mayo could have easily made a medicine to prevent memories from sticking. In other words, Mayo could use a magecraft potion to stop short-term memories from being recorded into long-term ones. Waver thinks Toko may have taken such a medicine, not necessarily out of carelessness, but to comply with a client's wishes. Ultimately, after discovering Deidre's death, Byron wanted to prevent news of her death from spreading. He had Toko make Kalina into a fake princess, using a potion so that not even Toko would remember anything about the death. Waver holds out a lit cigar, drawing attention to its burning tip. Suddenly, Toko understands what he's talking about and starts laughing hysterically. Apparently, they used a Cinderella spell. Grey doesn't catch on, instead just thinking about the fairy tale. Perhaps it had something to do with the ashes falling from his cigar. Changing topics, he focuses back on the talisman, claiming that it was the leaf of a linden tree, the very one that prevented the hero Siegfried from being completely covered in the blood of Fafnir. Much like Achilles' famous heel, a leaf-shaped patch on Siegfried's back is known as his only weak spot. Miraculously, this leaf remained healthy into the modern age for mages to use as a summoning catalyst. That said, such an artifact can also be used as a one-time catalyst for a single spell. Waver is insinuating the leaf burned away, and its ashes were used in Toko's procedure. She admits it does add up, because Cinderella spells are spells of transformation. In Siegfried's case, the story of Fafnir's blood is about a man being reborn as an immortal hero. That leaf would be the perfect catalyst for someone else's rebirth. Like a phoenix reborn from its own ashes, the leaf's ashes would drastically improve the surgery. Toko just finds it crazy that she can't remember using it. Her laughter seems like blasphemy, given how it's in response to the destruction of such a precious piece of history. Byron confesses the leaf was only meant to be Toko's payment for the operation. He only needed Kalina to pass as Diadra for that one banquet, but Toko went above and beyond the call of duty by burning the leaf to perfect Kalina's surgery. While she can't remember doing it, she assumes she did it because it was more interesting that way. She wanted to make a more satisfying result than what she was asked to produce. Long story short, Waver proposes that because they weren't trying to make Diadra more beautiful, but rather just to replicate that beauty in Kalina's body, then they could have used Venus in place of the sun. During that time frame, a valuable configuration did occur, with Venus, the Moon, and Saturn all 120 degrees apart. It wasn't an ideal configuration, but it would have been more than enough for Byron's purposes. Toko, however, wanted to go the extra mile and requested the leaf so that she could produce the best possible result. Mick is visibly bothered by all this. He asks that if Kalina was standing in for Diadra at the banquet, then how did they also see Kalina during the princess's introduction? Waver explains it away by saying that since it was from a faraway balcony, the person standing in for Kalina was probably just a homunculus or puppet. Since Kalina herself doesn't normally have any magecraft properties, simply imitating her appearance would be simple enough. It's certainly nothing more impressive than the makeshift servants that drove their horse-drawn carriages, after all. Just like the magic on that carriage faded, causing it to collapse into mud, Kalina's spell would also fade come morning. Thus, when Diadra supposedly went to Rhinus's room to request asylum, the spell was already fading, which is why Grey and Rhinus could even hold a conversation with her. Furthermore, the one standing in for Kalina at that time was probably just Regina, since they're identical. Hearing this, both Grey and Rhinus feel a tinge of shame for never having noticed. Inori asks a question of her own. Somehow, when Kalina was a stand-in for Diadra, she was actually more beautiful than the original. If Byron was just trying to replicate Diadra's beauty, then how did that become the case? Was it the talisman's doing? Sure, that was part of it, but there was even more at play factors that not even Byron understood. Going back to the idea that those who look upon beauty become more beautiful themselves, the people who looked upon the princesses most were their maids. 
Thus, when Kalina was given the same beauty she always looked upon, her beauty was amplified even more. Sven then asks that if Kalina looking at Deidre made her more beautiful, shouldn't Estella have wound up more beautiful from having finally seen her sister? Apparently, Estella is actually blind. Waver figures this out based on the idea that mages will sometimes seal away one of their senses on a genetic level in order to enhance the others. If Estella is blind, then she has no need for mirrors, and since both princesses live in balance, it would explain why Deidre's room also lacked mirrors. That said, Estella's lack of sight prevented her from feeding off the magical energy circulation from gazing upon another's beauty, making her less beautiful than her sister or Colleen. Hearing this, Toko decides to confess that the one who hired her to oppose Waver and his students was actually Regina. She had gained Toko's cooperation by offering to reveal the secret behind the Princess of Gold's beauty. Now that Toko knows such beauty isn't something she can use or obtain for herself, she's decided to reveal the truth. This revelation implies that Regina was also the one who framed Rhinus for Deidre's murder. Still, Regina says nothing to this accusation, forcing Waver to continue his explanation. He reasons that Deidre must have originally died from Byron's research, pushing things too far. Thus, the fake Deidre worried about the same kind of thing when asking for asylum. Regardless, Deidre died, and so Kalina was made into a replacement on short notice. At the banquet, she impressed many spectators, who then began to think that the Aselmas could actually reach the root this way. Should the Mages Association hear of this, they would have given Byron and his operation a sealing designation. Now, normally, sealing designations are imposed to preserve rare magecraft that can't be replicated by future generations. Since Deidre and Estella aren't technically mages, they'd be safe from that, and Byron's work isn't necessarily impossible to repeat. It just took a long time to get there. Even so, the association would still be highly interested if the Aselma family really did find a way to reach the root. Thus, for as much as Byron wanted prestige and recognition for his work, he didn't want that kind of interference, so the easiest option to avoid it would be to show his research had a sudden setback. By staging Deidre's death as a murder, and framing Rhinus, a mage from an opposing faction, Byron could pretend he no longer had the means to reach the root. As for chopping up Deidre's body into little pieces, Byron likely did it as a means of extracting as much useful material as possible for his next experiment. Knowing that, there was no guarantee that Byron wouldn't wind up killing Estella or Kalina in further research. In that regard, they weren't lying when they sought asylum. Instead of actually getting Rhinus' cooperation, however, they planned to frame her for the murder and escape during the chaos. That brings us to the second incident, where Kalina herself was killed after returning to her normal appearance. Who actually killed her? Waver accuses Mayo Brishison Clinellis, which is odd considering he's supposed to be from a neutralist faction. The moment Mayo tries to deny it, Waver has flat reveal a bag of clothes found at the spring where Kalina was killed. Inside is the dress worn by the Princess of Gold. It was a travel bag Kalina had set up in advance to make her escape. When the magic wore off, she switched out of her dress and back into her maid attire before being killed. Now, only two people might have known about this escape attempt, that being Mayo and Islo, who'd be able to cover for the princess's absence. The fact that Trimau was there to witness the murder gave Waver an idea of which of those two actually committed it. Of all the mages present, Mayo and Islo are the least adept at combat and they wouldn't have been able to subdue Trimau without an intimate understanding of her structure. Conveniently, of the two, Mayo was able to get a close look at her during the banquet. Called out so clearly, Mayo's nervous shaking stops, only to ask why what he did was so wrong. He confesses that, at first, he was devastated to learn Deidre had died, but when he found out that Kalina had taken her place, he became relieved. Like an obsessed stalker, Mayo wanted to keep a piece of Deidre's beauty to remember her by. He knew her since childhood, after all. With Deidre essentially living on within Kalina, he wouldn't have to part with her. Of course, Kalina was trying to escape, alongside Regina and Estella, no less. Thus, while she confided in Mayo, asking for his help, he could only think about trying to stop their escape. A truly dedicated mage wouldn't just give up after having come so far, so his nature as a mage beat out his humanity, and he betrayed his childhood friend. Without so much as asking Kalina to come back, he straight up murdered her. 
Waver interprets this as a sign of weakness, that Mayo wanted to perfect the Iselma's magecraft, but lacked the courage to ask Kalina to return to his side, even at her own expense. Using Iskandar as an example, Waver says that ego is absolute. If you're going to sacrifice someone to achieve your ambition, own up to it with pride. In Waver's mind, based on what he learned from his servant in the Grail War, it's less about what your ambitions are or how they're achieved, and more about having the conviction to follow through on them. Using this logic, he condemns Mayo, and then asks why Regina and Estella bothered to cover for him. Estella admits they were going to run away that night, but stopped after hearing of Kalina's death. They stayed on the estate because Regina felt she could understand her sister's feelings. As they all grew up together, Mayo was focused on Diadra, but Kalina had eyes for him. Thus, even though he killed Kalina, Regina figured that her sister still wanted to protect him. Ironically then, had Mayo actually asked Kalina to return and die for the sake of their research, she probably would have done so. Tying up loose ends, Waver suspects that Inori was aware the Princess of Gold they saw at the banquet was a fake. She admits that she was suspicious, because while the Iselmas were progressing in their research, they weren't expected to succeed so gloriously for another few generations. She figured Byron must have done something to rush the process along. As a result, she was willing to let Atrum Galiasta cause a bit of havoc, if it meant exposing the truth. It was also her that hired Mick in another attempt at solving the puzzle. While Inorai remains the subject of interest here, Toko decides to find out if Inorai supported her sealing designation. Despite being teacher and student, Inorai declares she was in favor of the sealing. Given Toko's abilities, it was the right thing to do as a mage. After confirming this, Toko looks down, disappointed, only to notice her chest has been pierced through by a green blade, some sort of plant sprouting from her. Mayo begins to laugh. He likely put something else in the medicine Toko took to alter her memories. Trying to take her hostage and control her, he demands that she perform plastic surgery one more time on either Regina or Estella in order to fulfill the Iselma's dream. If not, the root protruding from her chest will wrap around her heart and other organs, crushing them on command. If she so much as activates her crest, the vines will respond. Like a boss, though, Toko just reminds him that she doesn't have her family's crest in the first place. The Aozaki crest was ultimately given to her sister Aoko, after all. She draws a rune on the plant, causing it to wither away, leaving a large hole in her chest. Treating it like no big deal, she tells Mayo that she doesn't have anything against him, but now that he's attacked her, it's too late to stop it. What the hell is she talking about? She tosses her cigarettes to Waver, asking him to give them back when she returns. So long as everyone minds their own business, it will only retaliate against her attacker. It's a countermeasure for various attempts on her life. Suddenly, her stomach bursts open, ripping apart her body to reveal a dark portal. From it, the same two eyes that Grey saw emanating from Toko's bag emerge. A horrific, indescribable creature flies out from the portal and takes hold of Mayo with a tentacle, dragging him back to be massacred by thousands of jaws. Too shocked to respond, everyone present watches as Mayo is pulled in. Grey, on the other hand, wants to help him and is reassured by seeing Toko's mangled face give her a smile. Grey deploys Ad, who had already absorbed the air's mana, and swiftly rushes forward. A single slash of her scythe cuts the tentacle in two, saving Mayo's life, even though the creature had already devoured part of his legs. Now that Grey has picked a fight with it, the creature begins to attack her. In response, Waver asks Finn to help out, and together, he and Grey cover the front line. Flat and Rhinus serve as support, hoping to interfere with the portal itself. Byron, who had looked directly into the creature's eyes, collapsed in a daze, so Waver has Enorai and Mick protect him and the others with a bounded field. Waver even convinces Atrum to help fight the creature. While it was Grey's stubborn kindness that antagonized it, Waver takes all the responsibility, praising her for her actions. The portal releases excess mana, which Grey uses to power her own assault. As a swarm of thorny tentacles fly from the portal, she weaves between them, cutting down seven in total. To a lesser extent, Sfin tears a tentacle apart with his phantasmal beast form. In the presence of another clock tower lord, however, Grey refrains from using Rongo Minyad. When things get dire then, Rhinus has Volume and Hydrargerum wrap around Grey and turn into a suit of armor. 
Doing so puts tremendous stress on Rhinus, as she must concentrate on having the Mercury match Gray's movements. In terms of raw power, Rhinus is inferior to her predecessor Kaneth, but her specialty is precision. More specifically, she excels at layering her magecraft on top of someone else's. It's how she was able to give Kaneth's Mystic Code a personality, and it's how she can enhance Grey here. Waver noticed this talent when she was 11, and helped her harness it as a strength over the years. Sven continues to cover Grey's blind spots, taking delight in the process. He basks in the chance to protect her like this, and while you might want to write him off as a creep, there's a sentimentality behind his animalistic obsession. Mages who continue to practice bestial magecraft are rare, because the process often robs them of their humanity. Not only was this burden forced on Sven from a young age, it also caused him to feel alienated from his peers. Even so, Waver saw his potential and helped him revive many of his family's lost abilities. This was great, but he still felt empty inside. That was until he first caught Grey's send. She was special, perhaps due to also finding it hard to deal with other people. She didn't fit in among the living, and her fear of ghosts alienated her from the dead. Thus, perhaps more than love, Sven sees Grey as a kindred spirit, and getting to fight with her brings out his greatest strength. By splitting his magical energy, Sven creates six copies of himself that all rush in. Despite all this, a single tentacle manages to slip through and head straight for Waver. Before it can strike, however, it is halted by an automata dropping from the ceiling. It's the very same puppet that attacked Rhinus in the forest outside the spring. Estella commands it, explaining that it was a gift Toko had made for Byron. Thanks to her armor, Grey can now move at nearly double her previous speed. To match her, the tentacle creature changes tactics, wrapping itself into the shape of a knight holding a thorned blade. This form is harder to strike, as the densely wrapped vines protect it. Even worse, this knight is able to mimic Grey's fighting style. When the creature uses even more vines to create additional familiars, Grey has Ad remove his first limiter. Between a scythe and the holy spear, Ad can take on other shapes as well. Since she's meant to buy time for Flat's analysis, she has Ad shift into a large shield to repel incoming attacks. This shield absorbs mana when struck, which she can release in a burst of flames. Flat finally finds a way to seal the creature away, and to protect everyone from a likely rebound, Waver has Atrum and his subordinates put up a barrier. Flat's incantations are unique, to say the least. By chanting Game Select, Intervention Start, and singing a melody, he pretends to play an invisible piano. The surrounding mana starts to respond to his control, creating a vortex of sorts that sucks the tentacle creature back into its void. As a last-ditch effort, the creature's main form with two eyes and countless jaws lashes out at Grey and Sven. With no time to call upon Rongo Minyad, Grey returns Ad to his scythe and strikes into the portal, creating a reactive shockwave that blasts away her armor. She absorbs more and more of its mana, exceeding her limit of safety. In tremendous pain, she continues to circulate that energy and smash it back into the portal. Her attempts to drive the creature back fail, though, causing even more eyes from within to react. Luckily, Waver steps in to relieve her. Having found Toko's bag, he tosses it at the creature, along with one of his cigars to protect it. In response, several tentacles try to stop it, but Grey slices through those as well. As the bag nears her, Grey transforms Ad once more, this time into a large hammer. Using mana to propel the hammer forward like a jet, Grey smashes the bag, causing it to launch like a shooting star through the tentacles and into the darkness. With a snap of his fingers, Waver has the bag open up, which in turn makes the portal start swallowing everything around it, including the creature itself. The pressure is so intense that Grey passes out. When she wakes up, the Tower of the Moon is mostly destroyed. Ultimately, the creature swallowed itself up, taking most of the tower with it. Byron and the others were taken to safety by Inorai and Mick, so it was thanks to Atram that Grey and her friends survived. Frustrated by his failure, Atram reasons that he still has another lead for a summoning catalyst. Waver then advises him not to take the Holy Grail War lightly, but we know how that goes. Taking these words as a personal attack, Atram mocks Waver, claiming that there's no way he can join the Grail War at this point. He agrees he won't be able to get in as a representative of the Clock Tower, but that won't stop him from finding some other way. Arrogantly walking away, 
Atrum proclaims that he'll prove himself. If he can't get a Dragon Slayer, he'll have to settle for a Dragon User. Sorry, dude, but you're not even remotely worthy of Medea, you prick. The epilogue of this volume continues, with Grey describing how the Clock Tower is designed to prevent non-mages from accidentally wandering in. On the outside, it looks like an old university, but inside, it may as well be a dangerous labyrinth filled with monsters and other secrets. That said, Waver's own private room isn't nearly that dangerous. Inside, he speaks with Luvia, telling her about the incident at the towers. In the aftermath, Mayo became permanently crippled, but at least he's still alive. Byron, in contrast, was pissed they didn't kill him, as his life as a mage may as well have ended there anyway. His family holdings were frozen, and Estella, Regina, and Islo are set to be investigated. Mayo's family, the Brishisans, refused to take responsibility for his murder. In the end, it just boiled down to more political drama for the association. It came as quite a shock to Luvia's family, since the Edelfelts are part of the Democratic faction, along with the Valuelettas. In contrast, this incident earned the Elmaloys of the aristocratic faction a lot of praise and support. As for Toko, that body of hers was a puppet. Ever since she had a ceiling designation placed upon her, she had been spreading herself out amongst various bodies to deter enforcers. With crazy shit like that monster inside her, it's no wonder the association gave up trying to take her in. If that's the case, though, then why did Mayo's medicine even work on her? Well, her duplicate bodies are so well made, they're completely indistinguishable from the real deal, to the point that which body is her original is no longer relevant. Even though Grey is still recovering from that battle, she insists on staying active, cleaning the room as Waver and Luvia talk. Apparently, Luvia plans to stay at the Norwich dormitory, but rather than living in a single room, she intends to rent out an entire floor for herself. Throughout their conversation, Waver is busy writing a letter to Kalina's little sister. In truth, there was a third sister, who never got hired on by the Iselmas, and Waver wants to send her the Celtic charm Kalina wore. It was one piece of a Celtic whirl that normally comes in threes. The way these charms were split between the sisters reminds Luvia of her own family. Typically, mages only pass down their crest to a single child, but the Edelfeld family often has two heirs, called Scales. You may remember that in Fate Hollow Ataraxia, Angra Mainyu was trying to reconstruct the Fifth Grail War in Fuyuki using his memories of the Third Grail War. Well, in that war, two Edelfeld twins participated as a single master. Luvia also has a sister, but she prefers to stay at home. Changing topics, she asks who was it that gave Byron enough money to outbid Atrum Galiasta in the first place. Sadly, Waver never figured that one out, and apparently Byron is claiming to have amnesia regarding the auction. Mage families often hide their wealth in various forms, so it can be hard to evaluate their real worth. Furthermore, Waver can't shake the idea that someone was pulling the strings by getting Toko involved. Was it really a coincidence that Kalina surpassed Diadra in terms of beauty? They are interrupted when Flat bursts through the door. Luvia reasonably takes issue with Flat's nonchalant lack of etiquette. His optimism is off-putting, causing Luvia to retaliate with gundo shots that don't work. Sfin comes in afterward to reprimand Flat. Likely due to his bestial magecraft, the injuries he sustained healed in only three days. As usual, though, he becomes entranced with Grey's Send, only to be scolded by Waver once more. With the addition of Luvia, his class has become even more chaotic than normal. In his place, Grey steps in to reprimand the three of them, which she feels embarrassed about later. While considering taking on a part-time job to afford better tools when polishing Waver's shoes, she peeks into his room and finds him holding Iskandar's catalyst. After basking in a mess of different emotions, he says to himself, I feel like you'd just laugh and call me a novice again, wouldn't you? Grey doesn't have many things she desires, but after seeing her master in that moment, her first wish after coming to London is hoping that he and Iskandar can meet again someday. This puts an end to Volume 3 of this series. That was a lot to digest, so until next time, go ahead and tell me your favorite moments in the comments below. Thanks for watching! 
If you enjoy this channel, help us grow by liking, commenting, sharing the video, subscribing to Otaku Daikun, and most of all, smashing that notification bell so you don't miss out on all of our anime discussion, lore, or Let's Play content. You can support us directly through Patreon, Subscribestar, or our YouTube membership, all of which come with benefits like exclusive vids and early access. As always, celebrate, celebrate your, your fandom! fandom. Hey guys, I want to go ahead and give a special shout out to all my $10 and up supporters. Video Gamer 75, C James Torley, Steven Elak, Samuel Gersten, Otaku Mom, Jens Bauman, Mystic Samurai 1983, Freebrick, Cosmonaut, RNG or Shuffles 1498, Alexis Yukio Gomez Yamato, Johnny Tsunami, Link Pendrago, Logan Pasquale, Caitlin P, Vladimir Rovna, Succubus Sakura, Normace, and SF Giants fan Mike. Thank you all so much.